Welcome to Composing with Sound, our week eight lecture entitled Composing with Digital Audio. In this lecture, we're going to provide some feedback on assessment two, and we're going to look ahead to the final assessment, and we're going to discuss digital audio, quantization, sampling rate, and aliasing. Our goal in this lecture is to become familiar with technical details of digital audio as a basis for further study and as a foundation for understanding audio processing and effects. We also want to consider the creative applications of live processing and sampled audio. And in the tutorial this week, I have a little demo of some live processing and we're going to work through some processes with recorded audio in Max. So uh, reviewing your work for assessment number two, your feedback is available on the MyGrades link on UTS Online. I have some general points. Uh, generally everybody did very well. Uh, everybody has made some progress and you might be asking yourselves, well, progress towards what? And the answer to that is that you're progressing towards uh, creating your own independent creative works uh, in groups of two, in Max for presentation at the end of the semester. A couple of things that uh, I picked up in quite a few of your presentations. Uh, the definition of the term additive synthesis. We spent quite a bit of time at the beginning of the semester exploring these concepts, and I just want to touch back on those. Uh, and generally, everybody seems to have understood the patching paradigm. And this is really great because patching in Max is not that dissimilar to patching in a modular synthesizer or in fact patching together a system in the studio. And so a basic understanding of uh, signal flow is uh, critical to that understanding. And so we might just touch on some aspects of patching that Max doesn't necessarily make all that clear and that is serial and parallel connection. So we'll get on to that in this lecture. I'm also going to use some material from uh, LinkedIn Learning to provide some background information on digital audio. So what is additive synthesis? Well, uh, our glossary, uh, which you can see linked here on UTS Online, suggests that additive synthesis is the technique of combining simple sine wave components or partials to create a complex waveform. Both harmonic and inharmonic sounds may be created by applying unique amplitude envelopes to each partial. So I just want to try and consolidate that uh, definition. And by doing that, I draw in some concepts around signal flow. So you will remember this slide from an earlier lecture. The slide details work that was done in uh, the late 70s, the first work on digital uh, synthesis in which uh, Mora and Gray analyzed the sounds of acoustic instruments and broke them down into individual partials or harmonic components and uh, mapped or graphed the amplitudes of each of those harmonic components over time. So each curve in this drawing that you can see on the screen is a curve that represents the varying amplitude of an individual sine wave. Now, for a harmonic sound, those sine waves, the frequency of those sine waves, will be related. And each one is related as an integer multiple of the fundamental or lowest sine wave component in the, the tone. So we can diagram that uh, system. We can diagram a system for producing additive synthesis in a simplified schematic diagram. Now, schematic diagrams are really useful to help clarify our ideas about developing patches. So you can see this schematic diagram is made up of some symbols which represent different components in an additive synthesis patch. You can see we have an oscillator, uh, shown here as VCO or voltage controlled oscillator in, in Max, that's the cycle object. We have an amplifier, which in Max is really a multiply object. We have an envelope generator, and you've seen in Max that we can use the function object or the ADSR object to fulfill that function. 
and we have a mixer. Now in Max we don't explicitly need to create a mixer because whenever we connect two audio patch chords to one input we are in effect mixing or adding those signals together. Now that's not explicitly clear in Max but that's what's going on. So we can use this diagram to explore some concepts around signal flow, uh, around troubleshooting or tracing signals in a signal path. So uh, let's just uh, break this diagram down. Uh, you can see here that I've added a multiply object for a control signal which is used to specify the frequency of each oscillator in this patch. Audio and control signals always flow through connections, which in Max are represented as patch cables. In the studio, they're actual physical cables. Uh, and the signal flows from a source to a destination. And you can see the arrowheads on the lines in this diagram representing uh, the direction of flow from one object to another object. And in Max, the paradigm is that uh, outputs are at the bottom of the objects and inputs are at the top of the objects. So the connections from one, one object to another are what we might call serial connections. Parallel connections allow two signal paths to be added together. And so here the blue box uh, isolates one serial connection from a multiply object to a sine wave oscillator to a, an amplifier and off to a mixer. This red line shows the signal path. Now this blue box shows how two of these identical signal paths sit side by side or in parallel and they're both passed off to the same destination. There's two parallel signal paths here and you'll see this kind of parallel connection in typical synthesizer patches but it can also be used in, uh, for example, in Pro Tools where you might set up uh, two buses with two different sets of processing on them. So I want you to stop and think about these signal flow concepts and to think about aspects of signal flow that you might be feeling a little bit vague about, have some questions about. I want you to stop the video now and just think about what you do and don't understand about signal flow in Max. Make a note and bring it in in the tutorial and ask a question. Okay, uh, continuing on review of the subject so far. I want you to make sure that you've uh, had a good look at all of the uh, video content in the YouTube playlist for Composing with Sound. There's a few little added extras that we haven't uh, necessarily looked on in the lectures and tutorials. For example, there's a, a video on gain and decibels, which uh, will add some useful information to the content that we're going to present in this lecture. Make sure that you have completed any of the outstanding quizzes. Uh, it's more important to me that you complete the quizzes and you consider the concepts that are presented in the quizzes. We've had our last quiz now, so make sure you've completed them all. Now looking ahead to the final assessment, uh, you're aiming uh, to create a three minute composition, uh, which you will present in class in the final weeks. And you're going to submit uh, an associated patch file plus an individual 1000 word report. Now remember we're working in pairs. I sent out an email today to the few remaining students who haven't paired up. Uh, working in pairs you will create an original max patch and a novel sound composition. Compositions may be presented as fixed works, that is uh, you press a button to start the work and it plays out or as an interactive system, uh, which might be something that an audience interacts with, or a more straightforward performance system, as we did in assessment two. As well as demonstrating 
technical proficiency in Max, students are encouraged to think creatively and make carefully considered choices regarding the presentation context and the audience experience. Now, the presentation context is a little bit strange. Uh, we're presenting in a, uh, a computer lab, which is a weird place to, uh, to present a work. But I want you to think about um, how that context might influence uh, the choices that you make in terms of the structure uh, of the presentation, how you uh, address the audience. A single max patch is to, produce, is to be produced and presented by each pair of students, but each individual student will produce separate written documentation that aims to integrate theoretical, cultural and creative background with a report on the chosen forms, methods, materials and technical design employed in the project. Now we'll get into some more detail on this as we go through the semester, but you might want to think about uh, separating the role of each person in the class. Uh, think about the separate research that you might conduct that, you, that gives you something unique to write about uh, in your project. All patch and document files are submitted online through the assessment link on UTS Online. If you have any questions or concerns about uh, what we're doing for this final task, please uh, get those questions down and ask them during the tutorial. Okay, so moving on to the ideas around sampling and digital audio. I want you to stop for a second and think, consider the following. Uh, I want you to give two definitions of the word sample. Now we use sample in the context of audio production in a number of different ways. And I want you to think about uh, what some of those different ways of using the term sample are. So pause the video now, have a think about it, and uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion either now or later in the tutorial. Okay, now there's some great uh, video training material available on LinkedIn Learning, and I'm going to play some of that for you now. This first video considers what the differences are between uh, analog and digital systems and how we move signals in and out of analog and digital systems. Now in this next video we get into the nitty-gritty of uh, sampling, sampling rate, quantization and aliasing, some of the technical aspects of how digital audio operates. So just to summarize some of the key points from the, the video, uh, digital audio is what we might call a discrete time representation of an audio signal. Analog signals are continuous signals, whereas digital signals are broken up into small units of time. Each sample in a digital audio system is one discrete amplitude measurement captured and stored at the sampling rate. Now, for compact disc digital audio, that sampling rate is 44,100 samples per second, and each sampling period is 1 44,000th of a second long. So that sampling rate is the rate at which the signal amplitude is captured and stored, and for accurate representation of an audio signal, the sampling rate must be at least twice the highest frequency to be reproduced. Now, for audio systems, it must be at least twice uh, 20,000 Hz, which is the highest frequency that we can hear. So that means the minimum, is, the minimum sampling rate is going to be 40,000 samples per second. The Nyquist frequency is half the sampling rate. That is the maximum frequency that can be produced. We want the Nyquist frequency to be at least 20,000 Hz. If our audio signal exceeds the Nyquist frequency, we get a kind of distortion called aliasing distortion. This kind of distortion sounds like inharmonic partials, a strange metallic sound, partials that are folded back down into the audio range. To avoid aliasing distortion, we use a low-pass filter or an anti-aliasing filter. And you'll see in Max that some of the oscillator objects, for example the sawtooth oscillator, is an anti-aliased oscillator. It filters out frequency components above the Nyquist frequency. Okay, this video introduced some important concepts around amplitude quantization. 
the digital audio system uses the binary number system. And the basic unit of the binary number system, the digit, is called a bit, a binary digit. And it's either a zero or a one, unlike our decimal number system where each digit can be a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. The digital bit depth, or word length, is the number of binary bits used to measure a signal amplitude. The range of values that can be represented by a binary number is equal to 2 raised to the power of the bit depth. So for example, for compact disc digital audio, the maximum range of values is 2 to the power of 16. Now the base here, 2, represents the range of bits. There's only two of them, 0 or 1. So to complete that sum, 2 raised to the power of 16, it gives you the value of 65,536. In our video on decibels and amplitude, you will have seen the formula for calculating decibels is 20 times the base 10 log of the range. So 20 times the log of 65,536 equals 96 decibels of dynamic range, which is just about enough for most uh, kinds of music, and certainly much better than any audio storage or reproduction system before the advent of digital audio. Quantization distortion is a kind of distortion or noise that's produced by the difference between the actual amplitude of the analog signal and the quantized amplitude of a digital signal. So remember that the amplitude is broken down into steps, discrete steps, and those don't accurately represent the, uh, the actual amplitude of the analog signal. And the more bits we have, the more accurately we represent the signal, and the lower the quantization noise or quantization distortion. The level of the quantization noise or quantization distortion in decibels is roughly 6 dB times the number of bits used to represent the signal. So for a 16-bit signal, the quantization noise will be 96 decibels below the maximum level that we can record, which we usually represent as 0 dB full scale. A system used to minimize the audibility of quantization noise is something called dither. And when you bounce out a mix in Pro Tools, you will be adding dither as you go from 24 bits down to 16 bits. This is particularly important where we have fade outs, where we're re effectively reducing the number of bits that we're using to represent the signal. We must add dither before we apply a fade out in Pro Tools. Okay, so an important consideration and something that uh, I said we would touch on in Max is the causes of distortion. So once we've captured and stored our digital audio, we can manipulate it in lots of interesting ways and it's very easy to produce signal levels that exceed the maximum level that can be reproduced by our digital to analog converter. Our challenge in man managing digital audio in Max is keeping track of the amount of gain we've applied to the signal. Now this is the same for working in Pro Tools or any other digital audio workstation. The multiply object in Max is used to apply gain. And in this image you can see we've multiplied the signal by 2. Uh, 20 times the log of 2 is equal to 6 or 6 dB of gain. The number box in this, uh, in this image shows the instantaneous signal level and that will be ranging between plus and minus 2 as the output of the cycle object ranges between plus 1 and minus 1. The meter object shows the average level and it's very useful for being able to instantly see whether we've exceeded the maximum signal range of plus and minus one because we get a red light at the top of the meter. This video discusses some of these concepts about uh, signal range in digital audio systems and what happens when we apply gain.
OK, we've covered a lot of new and interesting material here. I uh, hope this has been helpful. Um, we've uh, reviewed uh, some of the concepts to do with signal flow, uh, and uh, we've related those concepts of signal flow to issues around additive synthesis, which is one of the points that uh, many of you stumbled on in your uh, presentation of your work for assessment two. And we've tried to get into the nitty gritty of digital audio. So in the tutorial, we're going to be handling digital audio in Max. And I'm going to present a little demo in the tutorial, so I hope you're all looking forward to that. Uh, there's some references uh, for the concepts that we've applied here, and I definitely recommend you check out that Digital Audio Foundation's uh, learning content on LinkedIn Learning. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Please store up your questions and ask them either now at the end of the lecture or in the tutorial. Okay, thanks for listening.